everybody. My name is Patrick Pichette. I'm the Chief Financial Officer here at Google. And everybody knows I'm Canadian. Uh, <laughs> welcome um, to this uh, great day for me uh, to actually introduce Ken. Uh, you, you, uh, there's a couple of things I want to do. This is also in cooperation with uh, International House in, at, at UC Berkeley. Woo, International House. International House is, uh, you know, it's part of uh, Berkeley. Some other people that are less known that have actually gone through there include like Eric Smith that you may have heard of and a couple others. So no, I mean, it's been a real powerhouse to bring the whole world together in one location as a, as a, a location. And uh, we're delighted to actually to uh, work with them to actually bring uh, Ken with us today. We, um, a couple of words just as a means of introduction. Um, in, uh, you know, in the last few months, obviously, I became quite famous with the movie Argo, but there was also a movie in Canada done a while back on the same topic, which was uh, quite exciting as well. Um, born and raised in Alberta, in, uh, in Calgary. So um, the, the, the only right city of Alberta, if you're a Calgarian, uh, for the people of Edmonton. And, uh, <laughs> and um, studied, went east after high school to uh, University of Toronto. A great career with uh, the Foreign Service in Canada that you're going to hear about today. But also thereafter, a great illustrious career as well, both in business and consulting and continues to be very, very active. Um, it's a real pleasure because, you know, occasionally in life, right, history knocks at your door and you have to decide if you're going to open the door or not. But in Ken's case, I mean, it really knocked at his door. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so without further ado, please, a great warm welcome to Mr. Uh, Patrick Fischer. That was great. That was great. Well, thank you very much for that very generous introduction. And um, I really are pulling essentially in spirit for the Montreal Canadiens. Don't, aren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Have a great day. Good, thanks. Well, what a delight to um, be here with you. Um, you've, you feel of the moment you arrive on the front driveway liberated, in a sense. It's, um, it leaves a corporate setting behind. And that's, of course, associated with yourselves. And I'd like to first, as though um, it was mentioned, Pat, my wife, is here. Uh, there's a bit of a Nye House story and dimension to our relationship. It's a bit like a Harlequin softback romance novel. Um, one day, having breakfast at 7 o'clock at International House, there was a young Australian girl, very attractive, the only one in the dining room. So naturally, where did I sit next to? in case we had some intellectual interests. <laughs> um, I said to Pat, what are you doing? She said, well, I'm in a bit of a hurry. I'm studying German because I need German for my PhD in bacteriology. Um, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm taking my MBA, and usually every Thursday we play golf. <laughs> Pat looked a bit quizzical and said, are you a student? I said, yes. So. The graduation was somewhat, on Pat's side, a bit more distinctive. Uh, as well, I, I thought today I'd give you a bit of background about how I got to Tehran, Pat and I, uh, which would touch on a bit of diplomacy and possibly the predicament we found ourselves with respect to around 33 years later. Uh, just a bit more on, on, on Berkeley, we ended up getting married in Berkeley in 1960. 1960. Pat has such patience. You know. <laughs> it was Saturday at 5 o'clock at St. Clement's Church, which is just down the street from Cal Stadium, the Bears Stadium Bowl. And the game was over, and most of the people heading home headed down the street to the church where we were married. And my mother said, my, you've made a lot of friends in a short time. <laughs> we then, of course, we're in California. Our first posting is Guatemala. I first heard I was going there during the days when democracy wasn't, when democracy didn't have anything to do with the Foreign Service. 
I mean, today in the Foreign Service, you may specialize. You may have a preference of where you'd like to go. I'm not suggesting you go there. But in any event, you know the setting. You know what's available. In those days, it was more like the military. Um, you guessed what was available. Say, in my own case, there were 12 locations available. But the director at that time thought there should be some drama to life. So what had happened, there'd be a party, and the minister would be there, the secretary of state in US terms. And everybody had a good time. And then they said, and now we're going to announce where you're going. This is a great moment in life. Just, you know, here's your first job, maybe your first career. You've got this idea, of maybe you're going to go to whatever was a sought after post at that time. And of course, the irony is what was sought after then some 50 years ago, maybe isn't so sought after today. But the posts were read out. One was going to Chicago, moan and groan, but I joined the Foreign Service to go somewhere exotic. The next one was a troubled spot in Africa. And he had his fiance there and said, no, I'm not going. So it was more like a John Bellucci movie. <laughs> finally, everybody decided where they were going, and then they finally announced I was going to Guatemala. So I phoned Pat, who was still finishing up her degree at, at Berkeley, and said, um, I know where we're going. She said, where? And I said, Guatemala. She said, oh, new culture, be quite different. I'm interested in pursuing science there. Where did you say we were going again? <laughs> so, and the Foreign Service in those days was a bit more relaxed than, than now in both countries, the US and Canada. So I said to the officials in Ottawa that we're in San Francisco, Oakland, we've just got married. I'd not like to, instead of taking a plane down to Guatemala City, take a slow boat, a Grace Line freighter, six passengers. I'd read about it in some advertisement in the New York or what have you. So Ottawa said, yeah, OK, as long as you get there by October 24th. I said, oh, that's lots of time. On November 12th, we were still on our route to Guatemala. <laughs> the navigator gets a telegram. I mean, this is, I know for all of you, getting a telegram must be a historic event. <laughs> but that's the way the world worked then. Ottawa, I never expected to hear from Ottawa. Where are you? So I thought, I wondered if I sent back a reply, a sort of a reply saying, adrift at sea. And I'm sure that would have been probably the first Foreign Service officer who was fired even before he got to his post. <laughs> so I decided not to. We went to Guatemala. Um, Pat again pursued her, her, her career as a, a bacteriologist, biologist. Then we went to um, Detroit. Not necessarily as exotic as a storybook posting, but interesting. We went then to Karachi, Pakistan. We then moved to London, swinging London. It was good. Then I went back to Ottawa. You've always got to return to your capital city, however arduous that may seem to you. Then we went to Tehran. And then after Tehran, I went to New York as Consul General. And then I decided I'd um, look for a change. So I resigned and ended up going with um, Nabisco Brands, RGR Nabisco, and was one of the group that seven or eight years later lost the bid to Henry Kravitz at 2 in the morning. Um, I would have preferred a different conclusion, but that's life, I guess, in, in, in corporate life. Um, the left, when we left Tehran, a bit about that, we, um, we were traveling in Canada and the United States, and we came to San Francisco in, say, April 1980, just after the U.S. diplomats, six of them had left with the Canadians. The remainder, you recall, stayed in Tehran for 444 days and were liberated, if you can use that word, the day that President Reagan the assumed office. Uh, President Carter went over to Germany to welcome them as one of his last official initiatives as, as president. Um, I sp um, spoke to the Commonwealth Club, which was uh, a privilege. And I was thinking, I spoke to them two days ago, and 
I recollected that here, 33 years ago, what, was, what were we talking about? I thought, recollected, well, we were talking about the valor and courage of US men and women who serve their country overseas, whether they're with the State Department, whether they're with the military, whether they're with the DEA, and uh, what that entails, particularly today in certain regions, which is recall, of course, through the tragedy in Benghazi, and of course, recently, the young foreign service officer in Afghanistan. 33 years later, it's almost the same subject. Some things don't change. A little aside to that period we were there is um, I was um, uh, asked um, to say something at the Berkeley Charter Day ceremony for the graduating class since um, I graduated there some time before. And it was the height of the animosity between Iran and the United States. There were a number of Iranian students, a number of US students, uh, some of whom felt uh, quite very committed to their own interpretation of what was going on in Iran. So the people at, at Berkeley, the authorities thought, well, this could be a, a precarious situation, but we're certainly not going to cancel Charter Day. So what they came up with, well, what we'll do is we'll get 10 police officers from Berkeley Police Force and from University of California and myself, and we'd all put on bulletproof vests. Um, certainly, I was quite pleased with that because it gave me shoulders, a chest, and I was, <laughs> felt quite confident with myself. So we were in the stadium underneath. The police officers were putting on their academic gowns, and I was saying, one of the police officers said, this is a great day for me. He said, I graduated from high school, and today I'm a university professor. <laughs> um, thinking back of, of, of the, 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 say, the time um, of Iran, of, of the United States, of the West, uh, gives a bit of a sense of, of the changing nature of, of diplomacy, the practice of diplomacy and largely to what your own efforts are doing to change the, the nature and the communication and the interconnectedness. When we joined the Foreign Service, part of the year's probation in Ottawa, um, among ourselves, myself and my 10 or 12 colleagues, we often wondered what you had to do to break probation. We all had our imaginative thoughts, but none of us were fired during the first year. And some of the Foreign Service officers returning from a posting, those who were just about to retire, talked about a diplomacy that I found, um, I think all of us found rather amusing and rather inviting. And that is the mail boat would arrive, say, in Tokyo, drop off the mail, and there'd be some inquiries. What's the tone or temperament of politics in Tokyo at the time? and the mail boat would be back in three weeks. It gave me time to reflect on what really is going on in the country, take a long lunch, and no snap judgments. Whereas today, as you can imagine, it's um, a, a quick exchange. There's a demand. And of course, if you take a capital city, whether it be Washington, Tokyo, Berlin, Ottawa, Everybody in that capital city thinks every other city with a diplomatic presence is exactly the same time as it is in the capital city. So there's no rules or regulations about what time you're, whatever company you're using. If it was a few years ago, and of course being very biased Canadian, I'd say whenever your Blackberry rings, you can, you're going through a transitional stage at the moment. But that's a, a, a changing nature of diplomacy um, in the sense of communication, interconnectedness, and what have you. In terms of um, how countries get along, I don't think it's, there's much of a change. It's, again, a bias here. I think to some extent is, is being reflected by the administration, current administration, by the use of the word engagement. Um, militarily, we haven't solved anything over the last 20 years. Um, the only people really who've gained, if you look at it at the moment, out of the, the tragic 
experience of both wars, Iraq, Afghanistan, are really the Iranians, ironically enough. The engagement or the trying to use diplomatic means, rather than resorting, rather than opening the top drawer of your desk and pulling out a gun, is largely through trying and patience with diplomacy. Now, to have diplomacy effective, of course, you've got to have some military presence, which balances the development and the diplomatic side. But, you know, the military is about power. Diplomacy is about influence. And one without the other isn't going to resolve anything. So at the moment, you have a, a situation where it's a, essentially a stalemate with respect to Iran, with respect to whether or not they're going to develop a bomb, and what to do about it. The, if I can use the, the West's side on negotiating, plus Russia and China, that is the P5, the Security Council, permanent members plus Germany, have essentially introduced sanctions, which are beginning to bite in Iran. The currency has fallen by at least 30%. Inflation is at least, again, 30%. Oil shipments are down 50%. Yet, at the same time, the Iranians are remaining defiant. There was some hope that during the last three meetings in Kazakhstan, that is last month, that the Iranians may soften their position somewhat, and that maybe there'd be some negotiating, again, flexibility by the P5 plus one. Um, both sides inch back a bit not necessarily to any avail. The other sort of approach that's used other than, um, say, the sanctions are the, um, the wars with the computer, the, um, cyberspace, and what have you, which has deferred the Iranians' progress somewhat. The other is the assassination of key Iranian scientists. Um, Three or four have been assassinated within the last um, six months. But uh, nothing seems to be moving the two sides closer together. <clears throat> the other alternative, of course, is that is, do you actually do what Israel did in Iraq and have a massive raid? And this is, as all of, all of us are aware, is a matter of some debate between Israel and um, to some extent, the, the, the P5 plus one, I, I think much more heated in the debate leading up to the last election. Um, there seems to be now some sort of a, 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 a hesitation by Israel to put forward a raid as the first alternative. Um, from my own personal point of view, and this is something all of you can make up in your own mind, of course, is I think the military option in this case would be catastrophic. I think it would only suspend Iranians' progress if, in fact, it is intending to develop a bomb by two or three years. It would unite the Iranians under whatever type of leadership happened to be at the moment. It would take away their option to look at an alternative. It may, in fact, close the Hormoz Gulf. It may introduce or encourage the Iranians to essentially take over Iraq, not just be their strong, powerful neighbor. So the, the option is not the, in its ultimate dimension, but one option is, is would you prefer to live with Iran with the bomb, without the bombing raid, without that retaliation, or would you prefer to go ahead and try to derail their progress towards the bomb? That's a, that's, um, a debatable question. Um, and I, at the moment, the decision is that under no consideration will the US, will those other P5 plus one, although I'm not sure about Russia and China if it comes down to it, or how far the Europeans are prepared to go on the alternative of the raid. But at the moment, the position is that Iran will not be allowed to have the power 
which they claim they're not pursuing in the first place. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tough, um, tough question. And it's, a, it's really, the, I think, the foreign policy question that's keeping on the lights in every capital a day. Of course, there's North Korea. Um, of course, there's the ascendancy of China. Um, there's an economic financial freefall, possibly, again. So there are other items that, one way or the other, deserve a headline. But if there's something that's fundamentally threatening to whatever we're going to pursue, it is that situation in the Middle East. And as it is, at least in my thought, there's, things are so complicated now that, remember, the Marshall Plan. That was one massive plan which addressed Europe, essentially World War II. There seemed to be a, 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 the predicament lent itself to a massive one solution. But today, everything is linked. Everything's interconnected. And what you do in one country immediately has an impact elsewhere. Again, that suggest the reluctance to do an, undertake an initiative which seems to make sense. That is, why don't we do something in Syria? Um, what about, does it need to, do we have to have 100,000 casualties before something happens? Fine, but what do you do in Syria? I know, if you arm as Qatar and Saudi Arabia, are doing with Croatian arms largely, does that essentially maybe arm those who are seeking not necessarily a Syria that brings together good judgment, justice, and dignity, or are you arming essentially components of a, of a civil war? So, and then what you do in Syria, of course, has implications for the Hezbollah in Lebanon. And it goes back, of course, to Iran, which is really has its only allies in the area, if you can call them allies, Syria and Hezbollah. Or then do you get even more basic and say, this is a Sunni versus Shiite struggle. To a large extent, it's the fault of those with a pencil after World War I who wrote in borders well, let's create, let's change Macedonia. Let's draw this line here. This is going to be Lebanon. Um, this will be Iraq. And then the French, you can have that. The British will take that. Um, the US delegation essentially saying, well, as long as there's equity and uh, for, um, some sort of sense of democracy. But those days cut across tribal lines. They cut across religious lines so that you have a country that's unlike Iran, say, which is, what, 3,500 years old. You have artificial countries which made no sense other than the victor's sense of what was going to be convenient for both the French, the English, the Russians, and the Americans. Iran, current day, are looking back, if I could, just for a moment on... Um, leaving the, the big questions um, there, and maybe we can go over them in, um, in, in the question and answer. But um, taking a bit of a lighter note, um, the, we talked about the movie Argo, and um, we were last night with Hans and Shanti and, and um, David, Toby, and friends at International House. We had a talk and, and sort of talked about the movie and um, Pat and I saw it in, um, in Los Angeles. Um, ben Affleck asked us to Los Angeles when it became clear that Canada was not at all happy with the content or the, what would you say, the characterization of what happened in Iran. Um, it's a thrilling movie. It's exciting. And as I said last night, halfway through, Pat turned to me and said, did we get out OK? <laughs> I assured Pat that, yeah, we're OK. We're, we're in New York at the moment. 
Um, I, I think that it would, would have been pro more properly cited because, as you say, the, the, the caption underneath is based on a true story. I was thinking about that, and I said maybe it would be more apt if it based loosely on a true story. <laughs> and, but yet, at the same time, should we expect Hollywood to tailor its entertainment objectives and a big box office to history? History can run true, but not necessarily history isn't sometimes that exciting. The, the, the movie itself is, is correct in the sense that six U.S. diplomats eventually found themselves four with John Sheardown, <coughs> Zena, colleagues of mine, two of them with Pat and myself, and stayed with us for three months. Um, we became good friends over three months, um, despite the truism that if you have household guests over the weekend, it's difficult days for the next two weeks. Why not try three months? But they were, unlike in the movie again, those of you who saw it, they were not quite as agitated or restless as suggested. They were um, ideal guests. Um, they were a bit curious as to when they were going to get home. And I was thinking of the normal diplomatic procedure is when you leave a post, says ambassador, you're expected to write to your, your successor. And you say, um, the house is in good shape. The, the office, you're not going to need to hire some new staff to do this and that. And you generally meander around. Telling, I was just thinking about the letter that I'd send to my successor along those lines and say, by the way, you have some permanent residence. Um, my suggestion is that you give them Canadian passports and employ them at the embassy. They were beginning to think if I was serious. But it was a, um, it was a, a bizarre time. It, it um, went very smoothly. And um, although there was a fair amount of tension, particularly when we understood that one of the newspapers in Montreal had, to a large extent, the story. Uh, they were prevailed upon by, by the prime minister's office not to publish until it became clear maybe, maybe the Canadians had some people there. So what we did is we rented a house down a couple of blocks away with high walls, and we were figuring that 20 minutes lead time, we can move the six diplomats from our house down to the house down the street. And then the Iranians would come and say, We've got a group of Canadians here, that's all. Um, however, we didn't need to do that. But then it became clear, at least to those of us in Ottawa and those of us in Tehran, the Canadians, that these are US diplomats, and we're happy to look after them. But at the same time, there's the Canadian staff is in jeopardy and the local Iranians who are hired. So we were saying, this is what we're proposing to do even though they're U.S. diplomats, we've got to get them home. But they are U.S. diplomats, and as understandably, Washington wasn't prepared to hold the whole responsibilities over the Canadians. But what we proposed is that they become Canadians. So in Ottawa, they created a whole new identity for all of the diplomats. Um, credit cards, academic records, phone bills, whatever you carry in your pockets. And at that time, Washington did say they would become involved and added a movie team to some of the alternatives we had. And eventually, um, CIA representatives came over the last day and a half, and um, we essentially said what we were going to do. And there was some decision to be, take it out as a movie team, and we left. But however, it wasn't quite as frenzied at the airport as in the movie. <laughs> as I said to Pat, boy, this looks like an exciting time. But, um, what had happened is three weeks before, um, Pat, and again, I mentioned this last night to at the International House, three weeks before, Pat had been paid <coughs> for two of her jobs, one at the Pasteur Institute and one at the Iranian Blood Transfusion Service. So Pat was um, paid. They said, well, are you, Pat said, I'm leaving. 
I'm coming back, she said, but I'm leaving. And they said, well, we'll sort that out. So Pat came back, came past by the embassy, and said, I've got some back pay. Very thoughtful, the Iranians came back here. I said, wonderful. She said, no, I think so, too. I said, could I have it? She said, the cash? And I said, yes. She said, well, $20,000. I said, well, that's great. Um, what I want to do is I want to buy some airline tickets for the U.S. diplomats. Um, one ticket on SAS, one ticket on Swiss Air, one ticket on BA. And um, again, I said, previous um, Pat to this day claims that I didn't pay her back the $20,000. <laughs> I think I did, but it's in doubt. So. But I'll, 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 I'll check back my records. But it was very convenient, as opposed to the scene in the movie, which, of course, ratcheted up the tension, where somehow the Washington, the White House had canceled it. They were waiting to get Hamilton Jordan's son at school, blackmailing the teacher. Um, I'm looking at this movie. I said, I would have loved to have been there. <laughs> and then eventually getting the, getting the right. The other, um, just closing, just before <clears throat> some, some questions, is again something that, that um, Pat and I have talked about and shared, is that the depiction that, of Iranian history, which of course you needed, the introduction of the movie, um, Tehran and the thing, was, is not really fair to the Iranian people. Um, this was a revolution. The movie essentially showed those in the middle of a revolution. And, um, Nothing in a revolution is anticipated or predictable. The citizens' conduct, the scores that are being settled, all make up a revolution. However, the movie portrayed the Iranians as having only one side, that is, um, vent on violence, retribution, revolution. Whereas after myself and living there three years, is, is we found that the Iranians certainly have their own future they're seeking. But at the same time, they were very hospitable, very thoughtful, and um, very interested in the outside world and hoping for some sense that their own life follow a pattern where they do have some sense of, again, of free expression, justice, and dignity. So although, as I say, I thought the, I was happy for Time Warner and Ben, of course, um, and a flick that won the Oscar, and that it is just a movie, and it was entertaining and thrilling, it really isn't a matter of a historic record. But it did, in a sense, recall, as I mentioned earlier, the nature of work overseas for particularly those from the United States, because their country stands out in, as a symbol for either liberty or a symbol of somewhere or the other that they have oppressed the people, either through the dictator, either through support for the current government, or one way or the other. It's that symbol that particularly, in a sense, emphasizes the degree of jeopardy um, the US presence holds. So at that point, I'd be um, happy to try to address any questions, positive, negative, otherwise. Thank you for coming. My question is, like, you know, it seemed, now for me reflecting back, it seemed kind of a waste. And these governments are kind of pushing these agendas that are you know, untrue. You just said that the movie was portraying the Iranians as one side. Mm -hmm. The Cold War portrayed all Russians as mm -hmm. not as good as people in North America, which is not true. Yes, the leaders have that different. But when you know, we have so much more information. We have from, you know, you're saying the telegraph. We have internet now. How do you kind of reflect back on what you saw during that period, and what do you predict in the future of, can we not per have an agenda where we're all one world and not us and them? Well, I sort of um, hope that one way or the other we get a bit closer to that. But if you look at the, the, the first go at the League of Nations, and um, that didn't lead us anywhere. Now the United Nations is, I, I think, there's some reservations expressed about the United Nations, but if we didn't have it in the form it is now, we'd create another one like it. 
And um, I think that what is happening is, again, touched upon earlier, that given the degree of interconnectedness with the world now, is that there are those who, in a pol political aspirants in the United States or Canada, what have you, talk about more or less what could be identified as an isolationist policy. There's no such thing. A politician can talk about an isolation policy, or the US pulling back, or France pulling back, or Germany not being so deeply involved in the Euro crisis. But the nature of society today, the exchange of information, and everything that is, is really reflected largely yourself very much part of it, is, is changed everything fundamentally. And I think people are going to maybe have a better chance of having some some mutual interest coming ahead in the future than, say, in the past um, past years. Thank you. Hi, uh, Hi. fellow Canadian here. Um, thank you for coming to Google. Um, I just had a question about one of the subplots in the movie that I was wondering whether it was factual or not, and that is like the role of the housekeeper in your house and whether that was a real person and if you yeah. if you kept in touch or know what became of her. Um, well, there's a, a lot of um, people in the movie who I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, certainly Pat, although um, working as a, a largely ran the, the household, and in fact, um, we did not have a, a maid. Um, we had a staff of five, and they were all male. And um, it was to the staff of five that, that Pat explained that um, we've got two Canadians staying with us. They're traveling light. They're tourists, but they have no curiosity about leaving the house. <laughs> they found this quite puzzling. But um, Pat is very persuasive. <laughs> I mean, I met Pat. It was when we said we met at breakfast. That's 55 years ago. And I've never won a debate with Pat yet. So <laughs> what chance did the staff have? So it was um, one of those things I said. It, it added a poignant sort of touch to it. That he, there she is, a, a young woman, brave, courageous, facing the say the colonel from the Secret Service in Iran, and then having to find herself surreptitiously over the border to Iraq. It's, it's, it came across well, but of course had no no touch with reality. Uh, we have a couple questions from uh, our folks at other locations. Uh, this is from Douglas Dickinson in uh, Kirkland. Uh, the, intro the introduction of the Argo movie provides an interesting summary of the geopolitical turmoil from foreign attempts to exploit Iran's oil resources. How well does this match the perspective of, one, your embassy staff, and two, the Iranian city citizens and government? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, if you look back at... Um, Iranian history in 1901, roughly, that was when the concession almost entirely was given over to the British with respect to oil revenues, a, a marginal percentage given to the Iranians. And then the, I think one of the key moments in Iranian history, at least in the last century, was when um, Prime Minister Mossadegh was overthrown, um, largely a coup called, engineered by the Great Britain and the United States, called Operation Ajax. Um, Mossadegh was um, a nationalist. He was, um, I think most Iranian feels that he was their one avenue to democracy. He was very eccentric. He, um, he um, appeared in, at the UN uh, largely in, in, um, in an unorthodox speech, very articulate but um, um, succinct, but not at all, and contrary to the thinking. He, his, his, his ways were contrary to the traditional monarchy, which was the Shah's father and himself. But what he was asking for is the nationalization, under fair terms, of the Iranian petroleum resources. Um, this particularly disturbed the British. Um, a coup particularly um, against Mossadegh, appeared to the US because, of course, this was in the middle of the Cold War. So for two 
contrary but complementary, and in that sense, complementary objectives. Mossadegh was removed, overthrown, put in house arrest, and the Shah, who had departed a week earlier for Rome, was brought back. So oil is, of course, always been the axis on which Iran's interests and interests outside of the country have been based. Um, soon after that, of course, in the 60s, 70s, petroleum prices accelerated, and the oil became Iran's. And with the revenues, royalties paid to the foreign investors. So, the, But there was a point where Iran, in, in its history, was the focal point of other countries' interests because of its natural resources. Our own interest as a, if you can say, a medium-sized country in, in Tehran was um, trading with a country who was on the brink of becoming fabulously wealthy from our point. That's why there were 90 embassies in Tehran, each looking for some part of the petrodollar. And uh, uh, the largely sustaining that flow of income was Iran's um, oil production. Okay, we have one more from uh, Evgeny in Kirkland. Uh, seeing a revolution in the past, were you optimistic when the Arab Spring started, and are you optimistic about it now? I think I'm, I'm not necessarily optimistic, but I guess I wasn't surprised. Um, certainly surprised by the suddenness in, in, in Egypt and the spontaneous combustion that Tunisia entered into. Um, Surprised that it happened so suddenly, but not surprised that it happened eventually. Uh, here's, here's a situation, say, in Egypt, where the president openly was nominating his own son as his successor. Um, there was the case in Tunisia where the president obviously was banking his more than his share, if you can put it that way, in an offshore bank. But what really motivated, I think, the, the Egypt, Tunisia, to the, some extent Libya, is the, the younger people. Not necessarily the university students entirely, but younger people who saw no future. Um, and there was no sense of justice. There was no sense of, 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 a, of a, anything improving. It was just going to be more of the same. And what happened is a feeling cut across, particularly the younger, those under 35, that we can't put up with this anymore. And what happened innocently enough, of course, caught the imagination of a whole segment of the population. Now, whether I'm optimistic about the, the final aspect or outcome, I think we've, we've all got to wait. Um, you know, it took a long time for a number of mature countries to find their own equilibrium. And patience maybe is an overworked word, but we can't expect, I don't think, those of us from, say, a country that's developed with a, if you can use, use the word, responsible government, to settle and achieve what they really want to have. And I think what early on, if one disappointment is that um, in Egypt, where the Muslim Brotherhood has, has, um, has wrestled with um, substantial challenges, but don't seem to have approached a, a, a degree or a, a, uh, approached the issue in an accommodating sense. It's either us or them. And, um, Complicating is something that I touched upon earlier, is that Sunni versus Shiite. And then there you've got Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the others versus, in a sense, Iran. And then, of course, we mustn't forget about um, Pakistan and India. And you could go on, because they're all linked. You, you, it's, it's impossible. These days, it's so complex, uh, touched earlier, that Let's resolve the situation in Libya. Sure, but what's that got to do with elsewhere? It's resolve it there, but what cost did that come out for somewhere else? We've always had, uh, based on true story, movies and things like that, but now that we're having movies that are being taught almost as historic fact, 
uh, for example, Abraham Lincoln, I heard, is, is also being taught in schools. Something like this story, Argo, we have people who lived through it, who were part of that, who can uh, bring a little bit of clarity to the story. Abraham Lincoln is not so cut and dry. Um, would you pursue uh, additional differentiation labels, labels in industry that say this is loosely based on historic fact, this is not historic fact? And then how would you feel about um, movies that are loosely based on historic fact to get the story out versus um, stories not getting out at all? Um, well, it's a bit of a devil's dilemma. Um, what I, I think is, is important as one consideration is, say with a movie that doesn't really come close to historical fact, is that all is what younger people have it to base it on? Uh, and I'm thinking now of those uh, younger teenagers or what have you before, maybe they pursue it in a history class or they do some reading or what have you. But that's the image. And movies are so powerful. Um, that's, that's the impression you're left with. I think I'd prefer to have something come up or emerge as a historical fact in a natural, maybe accidental way, rather than engineered through a movie that tells half the truth and then you rely on a degree of curiosity to bring the actual truth to the surface. Um, Zero Dark Thirty, again, was, it was a coincidence, I think, that all the three movies that were potential um, nominees for the best picture all had a dimension of whether or not this is true or not. Um, Argo certainly um, more than maybe the others, but the, um, uh, the facts were there contrary to the, 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 recept, uh, the way they were cited by uh, Hollywood. Now whether you could get to some size, you know, that um, this movie is NR, this movie is PG, this movie is over 17, accompanied by an adult. Maybe you could do that in historical definition. Half believe this movie. <laughs> Gradations with a little insignia. I, I think the audience would say, well, look, I'm going to be entertained. I mean, I'll, I'll work out the truth myself. But the question really is, is, is a perceptive one. It's, a, it's really, at the, uh, to some extent, the heart of, um, of, of um, what's entertainment. Thank you very much uh, for coming here. I'm actually an Iranian American, so I really appreciate the insight you're offering. Um, I was born after the revolution, and just through family, friends, uh, reading, what I, what I find fascinating about the revolution itself was that there was these successive rounds of takeover by certain groups. Um, and, uh, and even today, during the nuclear negotiations, what I hear a lot on the Iranian side is, to me, mostly for domestic consumption and for domestic public opinion. To, to what degree do you think the hostage crisis was uh, played into that role? I, I find it to be a sort of a tipping point for clerics to take over in that broad chaos that ensured after the revolution. Do you, do you agree with that point? Yeah. <clears throat> I, when uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini arrived, it was not clear that he was going to have an open invitation to rule. It, there were four factions, all fighting for that leadership position. And without a doubt, in my mind, the Ayatollah used the US hostage situation and manipulated it into such a, a way. He's a very astute politician, um, quite apart from being um, seen as the ultimate leader. Um, and that he's, he's very shrewd. And that what started out to some degree um, a, a takeover to last a few days by a group of young Iranians who felt that the country was not following the line of the Imam was taken over largely by the Oman's group and carried through and convinced the population that this is the party who is going to lead us. So it, um, it, that, uh, that's your impressions at least in, in my case, uh, in my sense, are, are, are right. It um, was something, and, and maybe that's um, politics. There's opportunities arise, and politician has to grab it and take advantage of it. And certainly the, the group, but although then after he came in, there's an intriguing conversation I had with one of his secular supporters, Ibrahim Yazdi, who became foreign minister and um, was, um, 
took his PhD in the US, but very close to Omeni, and in Paris. And I said, I was talking to him, and I said, well, things aren't going very well in terms of your government. There uh, seems to be internal problems. You're having trouble sorting out priorities and what have you to Khomeini. And um, what he said is, well, we thought we'd be in Paris for five years. We never thought the Shah's regime would collapse like that. So he said, we weren't prepared in a sense. Um, we, we didn't really know what to do with our mandate of power. But um, that was after the fact, after the um, take over the U.S. Embassy, that, that, that was, that was um, made clear. Thank you. Hi. Um, as a Canadian-Iranian, I want to thank you for coming here. It's great to hear this. I'd love to hear your thoughts. You talked about different ways to influence Iran, about the effectiveness of sanctions, and what your opinion is about that. Because as you mentioned, currency is devalued, inflation has gone up. I think clearly there's a lot of talk about how it's affecting Iranians inside and outside Iran. The sanctions are always questionable. You can, I think it's still debated whether sanctions are responsible for resolving the South African situation. Um, that's going to be the, the perpetual debate, I think, about sanctions, at least post-World War II. The other um, aspect of sanctions leading up to the Iranian thing was, remember the Iraq food for oil, where there were sanctions introduced into Iraq. And the, the point being there that the only people who suffered were the Iranian, ordinary, normal Iranian citi Iraqi citizens, not the leadership. In, in, um, in Tehran, in, in Iran, I, I think the, the, the Iranians are, are looking for their conduct in their business through two ways, one expediency and the other saving face. So how do you play that when you're, when you're negotiating? The thing? Um, one is um, negotiate with the Iranians by lifting some of the sanctions and say that we're not really about regime change here. We're talking about a more traditional accepted use of, of uh, nuclear power. So sanctions, though, as I think pre is prevails in most countries' thinking, are the only avenue at the moment to encourage or force the Iranians to the negotiating table. But even though they're beginning to bite, I'm wondering if that's the ultimate answer. Because the Iranians say, look, we've been taken over by countries over centuries. And we're defiant. And we can live with the sanctions. However, again, that's the leadership speaking. What about the, the people who are looking to make a livelihood, who find inflation up to here, whose foreign reserves are, in terms of their own money is down? So at the moment, of course, I find sanctions far more attractive than uh, a, a bombing raid. Or essentially, as I see it, this idea I think is totally naive that you think you're going to have a bombing raid and it's going to all be over. I mean, it's going to unleash aspects which are not predictable. And I think that certainly we can take um, some lesson from the Iraq and Afghanistan. The two conclusions we have were not what we expected. And um, let alone introducing a, 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 a catastrophic raid. But on the other hand, um, what about sanctions? Are they going to work or maybe they're not? So the question's um, uh, a good one. But no, I'm, I'm, you can really search for an adequate and proper answer and not come up with anything definitive. All right, thanks, uh, Ken and Pat. I'd want to thank you so much for joining us at Google today. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Hans and Shanti and the folks at International House for helping us uh, bring Ken and Pat here. Uh, so let's give them a nice Google applause. Thank you.